Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. I'd like to ask everyone to please rise, turn to face the flag of the United States to my right, please, and we'll begin our meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Thank you again and welcome to our first public forum for the redistricting committee here. So we are gathered with these two public forums and the second public forum will be on October 29th at 7 p.m. here at the Rush Center. We have two public forums for redistricting. So I'll talk about the process just for a moment. Each of the forums are designed to provide feedback back to the redistricting committee as they complete their work. So the, uh, this evening, we will have two parts of uh, our meeting, basically a presentation of the work so far by our redistricting committee, and then a time for public comment. And what we will do is record that public comment, take notes, and formally give that back to the committee. We do have a few people here I want to uh, recognize. Uh, also, we have some of our principals and members of the uh, uh, redistricting, redistricting committee are here. Um, also, uh, we have uh, Karen Berg, one of our board members that's present here, and Matt McIntyre, one of our board members, um, present as well, the board chair, Mr. McIntyre is. So I want to recognize them publicly. So Mr. Ford here, our, our director of pupil personnel, will come up here for a presentation. He'll talk about the work of the committee and present that to you. And then we'll take time for public comment. So while he's getting ready to do that, I'll just give you a few notes on the public comment. It's really not a debate of the proposals, just information and viewpoint from, from you that you, we want to gather. Um, this meeting is being uh, streamed live via YouTube right now. Uh, also, it will be recorded for further review if, if other members of the committee want, wish to see. We ask that anyone speaking Speak directly to the microphone there where Mr. Ford is. Uh, we'll use the sign-in sheet as the order of speaking if you do wish to speak. Uh, there will be a two minute time limit for speaking just for expediency's sake and for the, for the entire group. If we have more than a small number of people that wish to speak, uh, we'll put a five minute time limit on that if you're speaking on behalf of other people as well. There's a group of you that have the same viewpoint, the same thing you wanna communicate. You can have a little bit more time to express that. So that's all I have for you right now. We'll give you a couple uh, items when we get to that part of the uh, program. So Mr. Ford, I'll turn it over to you for the presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Uh, I will be leaving my mask on. I will respect for all guidelines. I hope that everyone can hear me. Um, if not, I, I will do my best to speak up, but uh, I am going to leave my mask on. The project is a redistricting project in, re in response to the board charge of populating our newest elementary school, Steeplechase Elementary School, which as most of you know is being constructed at the southernmost end at this time of Steeplechase community. For all projects of this nature, we have to subdivide other schools to populate the new school. Thus, that's been the charge of the board, uh, excuse me, our board of education to the redistricting committee, entitled the Demographics and Growth Committee. And I'd like to walk you through at this time just a brief presentation of the work behind this project. It's been going on for several months. If you please bear with me. When the redistricting committee, again, that's entitled the Demographics and Growth Committee for Moon County School Districts an ad hoc committee of the Board of Education, when it was given the charge to create a redistricting project uh, for the opening of a new school, there are vectors that the redistricting committee does the best of their ability to always respect and allow them to direct the work. Those vectors are, we make sure we try to look at what is education best for all the students involved. 
We do our best to maintain existing neighborhoods by using established community boundaries. We look to decrease overcrowding in schools to allow for future growth and increase population in declining schools to allow successful educational programs. We do our best to provide more consistent feeder patterns to middle schools and high schools. We look at uh, transporting our students by trying to provide clean boundaries with no crossing patterns to the best of our ability. Take into consideration time and distance that a student will be traveling on the bus. And then finally, we do our, uh, our best to look at socioeconomic makeup of the schools. Um, as I stated, in regards to this project, the committee charge is to move students to the creation of a new school, Steeplechase Elementary School, from the current elementary school districts. Moving students from New Haven Elementary School to Steeplechase Elementary School, and moving students from Collins Elementary School to Steeplechase Elementary School. The process is a very extensive, lengthy timeline that I'll go over more in detail in just a few moments. The Demographics and Growth Committee works in conjunction with the Boone County Planning Commission to develop a plan with the charge in mind. Specifically, that agency of the Boone County Planning Zoning Commission is the GIS Services Division under the direction of Mr. Steve Gay, here to my right. It's a computerized database that allows us to look at multiple scenarios based on our goals in a matter of minutes. I told you that there's a very extensive timeline. This project started over one year ago. We started to create a, a large number of possible scenarios, looking at the charge from the board to the committee. Six months out, we start to reduce those scenarios based on research and findings of data that we'd already initiated or we'd already been going through. Four months out, we tried to narrow the focus down to three possible scenarios within the committee. Three months out for the district committee is at their fullest intent of the work because that's where we're starting to get ready for board workshops and public forums like this one tonight. Two months out, we look at having our public forums. One month out, we look at narrowing all comments and work from the committee uh, and the findings from the public forums and the board workshop to identify a specific recommendation to the superintendent that will then go to the board for approval. The timeline goal, and it is just a goal, uh, for this project is December of this year. On the Demographics and Growth Committee, we have principals and parent representation from the affected schools. We have district level administration team and board members, and we have the GIS staff from the Boone County Planning Zone Commission. From district office, the committee is Mr. Turner, Mr. McCarter, Mr. Port, myself, Mr. Barracks, Mr. Raleigh, and Mr. Brock. You can see their titles there. Those are the district office representation. Our board members, as introduced already by Mr. Turner, are Ms. Bird. Mr. McIntyre, our school representation, Ms. Goble, Mr. Loring, Ms. Krieger, and Ms. Best, and our parent representation, Ms. Thornton, Ms. Penrose, and Ms. Northcutt. Finally, from the Planning Zone Commission, I've already introduced Mr. Gay. And Mr. Costello. Mr. Costello is not able to be present with us tonight due to a prior commitment, uh, but he is very valuable in helping us understand uh, projects and timelines uh, related to what's going on in the county, separate from the school district, with information that the committee needs to know as we move forward with our work. Our first committee meeting was held June 23rd. We went over the guidelines for all meetings and considerations for redistricting. We went over the charge of the Board of Education specifically, so the committee would know their, out, their outline of their work specifically as provided by the board. We looked at the present 
uh, presentation of current scenarios in regards to the timeline. And we started to review current scenarios and look for pros and cons with each. Our second and third meeting were August 3rd and August 17th. We continued to review both pros and cons of each scenario. We started to tweak those scenarios and we started answering questions among the committee. And that's why we have district office representation, county resource representation, board representation, and parent representation from communities within the schools. And then we started to come, after all that work, we came to a consensus on two scenarios to present to the Board of Education going into the board workshop. Those maps, the first map is our current school district boundary map, and the two scenarios are hanging on the wall for your review for you tonight at any time. We had a board workshop that occurred on September the 3rd. We went through the same presentation, almost exactly, that I'm providing right now, with our board, um, giving the same information, and we listened to feedback from the board. We took that information to our next committee meeting from the board and had further discussion before coming to this workshop. Tonight we enter the public forums, or the public forum stage of the process. We first, um, just for clarification to everyone involved, I want everyone to know that in accordance with state law in regards to these types of meetings, we started to advertise this public forum in the community recorder, which is the largest circulation for the county. And that was started uh, in September. Uh, also in September, mid-September, we posted the public forums on our district Facebook page. Um, it was also posted on the district calendar uh, and the district website. Also, uh, I delivered to the schools involved those same maps. So those maps are hanging, just like you see right here, they're hanging in New Haven Elementary School and Collins Elementary School, and the announcements of the public forums were also advertised on the websites from the schools. Along with that, with the assistance of our GIS staff, we mailed out uh, two weeks ago over 600 letters to families that had children that could be impacted by either one of these two scenarios. And um, those letters announced the, the public forum for tonight, also the public forum for October 29th that the superintendent has already alluded to, um, not only with the, the dates, but the times, location, and then the information about being responsive to uh, the guidelines put out by the, uh, excuse me, the uh, uh, department of, not the department of, no, to the department of health and county. In this scenario, we're going to give you the present situation. I've reviewed uh, some of the committee work. We'll continue to do that. We're going to present the two scenarios to you tonight. Uh, we are going to invite comments and feedback from the uh, community. And uh, then after the public forums, the committee will re-meet review all the comments, uh, review the scenarios, and see if we can come to a consensus based on all of the input and information that we gather. Not just within our committee meetings, but from the board workshop and the two public hearings, okay? Then we'll look at making a recommendation to the board that fulfills a balance of enrollment to the best of our ability, clear boundaries for the three schools and then growth potential. What you see on the board there is scenario number one. The brown colored area is New Haven. 
You see the green man, purpose color long branch, the light blue color urban back, the darker orange branch color, Ackerman, Collins Elementary School, uh, a portion of Collins Elementary School up to the far right hand corner. And then the blue area is steeplechase. If you look at uh, where Ackerman Elementary School, uh, the word Ackerman is uh, just down a little bit and out to the right, there's a red line. Technically all that blue below that red line is currently New Haven Elementary School. That section of New Haven would be shifted to Steeplechase Elementary School. The blue area above the red line is a section of Collins Elementary School that would be shifted to the new school. This is scenario one. So you see the area that would be shifted from New Haven and Collins Elementary School to populate the new elementary school, Steeplechase. Under the Demographics and Growth Committee proposed uh, redistricting plan, the following major subdivisions would, re would be redistricted to Steeplechase Elementary School in scenario one. From Collins Elementary School, we would be looking at shifting Richwood North Estates, White Pine Village, and Wisteria Village, those communities, to the new school. From New Haven, we'd be looking at shifting Deer Trace Community, Steeplechase Community, and Solomon Community to the new school. Numbers in regards to Steeplechase. Steeplechase is being built for a, a student population of 650 students. This redistricting proposal would uh, allow for 621 students. You see the impact that this project would have on Collins Elementary School, the reduction from over 800 students to 508 students. And in New Haven, the reduction from 900, over 900 students to a little under 600 students. The socioeconomic impact of this scenario Steeplechase would open at 74%, Collins Elementary School at 89%, and New Haven Elementary School at 27%. Scenario two, again, same type of idea. You see the area in blue that is the new that would be the new steeplechase community. What would be shifted from New Haven? And then we'll be shifted just that one little corner up there where the word Collins Elementary School is down to the new elementary school. In this scenario, the following major subdivisions will be redistricted to steeplechase. From Collins Elementary School, Old Lexington Villas, and Richwood North Estates. From New Haven Elementary School, Deer Trace, Steeplechase, Sutherland, and Triple Crown Jockey Club. Steeplechase were open in a much smaller capacity, or much smaller enrollment, excuse me, um, 521 students. Collins would be reduced to 682, and school has a capacity of only 672. And New Haven Elementary School would be reduced to around five and quarter. The social and economic impact on the schools, steeplechase would open at 60%, free and reduced lunch. Collins Elementary School would open at 91%, and New Haven Elementary School would open at approximately 27%. Under scenario two. Mr. Superintendent, to date, the Demographics and Growth Committee has worked to uh, look to propose these two scenarios at this time. And now at this time, we ask for and solicit feedback 
from the community to help us in uh, continued planning and engagement of our work process. And that's our presentation, sir. Okay, thank you, Mr. Ford, and thank you, committee members, for your work thus far. This will begin the public comments part of our meeting. Uh, Mr. Ford will join me up here on. Mr. Ford will join me up here at the desk, and we'll just read off, off some of the members of uh, the sign in sheet if you wish to speak. Please come up to the microphone over here to the left. Again, we'll have a two minute time limit. If you would uh, be brief, but get your, uh, your information across. This is a listening session for us. It's not necessarily a question and answer session. We just wanna hear input, feedback, views, concerns, and questions that will then go back to the committee for their work. Um, so again, we wanna take into consideration things that we may not have thought of or viewpoints that we may not have considered to this point. So we just wanna be sure we hear those. Uh, and again, as Mr. Ford said, the committee will take all of that information, put a recommendation in place uh, that'll come to me, and I'll make my recommendation to the school board, and the school board will make their final decision on the redistricting process. Uh, so, Mr. Ford, do you have some names there? Uh, yes, sir. First name, and I, I want to apologize up front if by chance I mispronounce the first or last name. Please forgive me. Uh, first, is Mr. Ben Johnson. I'm going to get a couple queued up. Right oh, I'm, thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Johnson will go first, and then um, Stacy Owens and Stephanie Crane. Those will be our first three uh, speakers in that order. Mr. Johnson, tonight, sir. Thank you. Thank you for letting me speak tonight. Um, my name is Ben Johnson, and I live in the Steeplechase community. And when I looked at these scenarios that were put up tonight, um, one of the things that I noticed that came to my mind before I even saw the map tonight was the red line. In the 1960s, areas of town were redlined and put off into certain communities. And the one thing that was mentioned here tonight, scenario one and two, was a red line that was put around these districts. Now, when I look at these, when I look at these different scenarios, I see steeplechase starting at 621 in scenario one. That gives them only 29 students to grow. When I see, um, I want to say Fort Collins because they're at 123% right now and of overgrowth. And uh, they're after redistricting, they would drop down 319 students, which is something they definitely need. Those students, even though they're free and reduced lunch, you know, need to have the space to be able to learn and be on t and not be on top of them. I taught for the school system for 11 and a half years. I taught here at Boone County at this ACE school here, and I know that the, the behavioral issues that are in school districts sometimes are more prevalent with students that are having their free and reduced lunch. And when we look at Collins being at already 123% and them dropping down 300 in scenario one, that's a great drop for them. But I see New Haven where my students go, and they love to go, they love their teachers, they love their principal, and they're dropping down 300 students, giving them 300 students to grow. But their free reduced lunch stays at 27% in both scenario one and scenario two. In scenario two, New Haven drops down another 74 students, giving them even more room over there, giving them 375 students to grow. But in scenario two, Steeplechase only has 129 to grow, with Collins back up, uh, 10 over their capacity. So in saying that, I thought I had five because I'm speaking. For You're speaking on behalf of others? The steeplechase community, because the, there's a lot of steeplechase people here tonight, but then they chose not to speak. Okay. Yes, okay. And so when I'm buying a house and a realtor takes me into that subdivision, the realtor tells me about the school district. <laughs> when I come into steeplechase and I come into Sutherland, they're going to say, this school here is at 74% free and reduced lunch. But if you go down Hicks, where they're building a bunch of new trip homes in Triple Crown, those houses, that school you'll go to is at 27%. So if we equal this out, even in scenario two, where we're at 60, and you dropped it down to 50, and put 
New Haven up 23% and Collins down to 78. That makes it equal. That means that when someone comes by as a home, if, I, if I'm at 50 and New Haven's at 50, then that means when New Haven grows, I grow. That means if I come, you come into my subdivision at sub, Steeple Chase or Sutherland and you wanna buy a home, then you're already at 50. You wanna go down to Hicks and buy a house in Triple Crown, they're at 50. And then you can choose to buy a home because you like it, not choose to buy a home because I'm feeling squeezed. And that's what the people of Steeple Chase and Sutherland feel. They feel like they're being squeezed right now. Either you sell your home and go put yourself more in debt and go buy a house down to Hicks or you put your kid in and pay $6,700 and put them in to Tim's, St. Tim's, or, or pay $9,000 and go put them in, in St. Henry. But I noticed when you did this, if I'm standing right in front of, of Triple Crown on Richwood Road, to the right and the east is all these trailer parks that you're referring to. And those homes are being scooped up along with steeplechase and Sutherland. But when I go with the Triple Crown, on scenario two, I feel like we're being pandered to by including what you call Triple Crown Jockey Club. In every entrance that I come into, the entrance just says, whether it's Hicks, Richwood, or Frogtown, it says Triple Crown. The people that live in Triple Crown say they live in Triple Crown. They don't say I live in the Triple Crown Jockey Club. But when you've gone up that street, to the left is Triple Crown Coffee, uh, uh, Jockey Club. To the right are $900,000 homes. These aren't even being considered as those kids coming. But when we talk about the third point that Mr. Ford made about transportation, my daughter has friends who live in Walton, Verona that are going to New Haven. They have to go up the interstate, go toward Louisville, go five miles up, get off Verona, go down Brown, and they're being transported. So we need to make this at 50-50 and try to give people the reason to buy this house because they want to buy it. When, when they grow, we grow. Thank you. Thank you. That's all. Good evening. In uh, Mr. Ford's presentation today, he said that the redistricting was for the success of all. He also said that our comments would be taken seriously and that the comments will go back to the committee. And he said that um, the committee will continue to adapt scenarios to work towards presentations for the board. Well, I have a few questions. First, why does your redistricting committee not include representation from the Steeplechase neighborhood, nor its homeowners association? Why are there not three scenarios presented to the board, which is standard operating procedure for millions of organizations worldwide? In your list of possible vectors to consider when redistricting, why is socioeconomic makeup of the school last on the list? Why would you even consider opening a new school at capacity when you don't have to? I'd also like to correct you on something you said in your September workshop where you said that steeplechase was pretty much built out and there wouldn't be a lot of growth down there. Well, there's 50 homes being built, as you know. There's also over 10 vacant lots in steeplechase. The townhouses are still being built and the apartments still have land to build on. So to say that it's pretty much built out, I don't know if that's 100% correct. And also to say that there's a squeeze factor built in, it's not really prudent when opening a school at capacity, especially if you don't have to. Um, and the September workshop, Mrs. Bird even mentioned not wanting to open at capacity and said that it would be okay if we had to, and then we could always add on in a couple of years. Again, that's concerning to me. You seem hyper-focused on Collins Elementary, and I understand that because they are ridiculously overcrowded. But that doesn't solve their performance issues. And the scenarios provided actually create a second Collins Elementary. Now that may sound harsh, but before you think I'm being critical or judgmental, and I'm speaking on behalf of my neighborhood, Collins students are my students when they come to high school because I'm the English Learner Newcomer Academy teacher. Those are my kids, and I love those kids. And everyone should have the opportunity to work with those kids. So please, for a moment, don't even think that I have a concern about the students who are being redistricted to steeplechase. 
My concern is that neither the Collins kids nor the steeplechase proposed student body stand a chance if you don't redistrict in such a way as to share the ethnic and socioeconomic diversity in this district with all schools to include Mann Elementary. Mann Elementary and Triple Crown should not be off limits. We have to stop catering to our wealthy clients and share the wealth. Our district is quick to state equity for all. Now's your time to prove it. There's no reason why redistricting cannot be done in a more horizontal manner on that county map. That way, everyone gets a helping from our melting pot. That's fair and that's equitable. Finally, Mr. Ford, you stated in your September 3rd workshop to the board, at any time, the board can provide new direction, new charge to the committee. You said that at any time, the board can ask you to go in a different direction. Well, we're here tonight to ask for just that. Hear our input, consider our ideas, and board, please direct the committee to create new scenarios that truly provide success for all by redistricting so that all schools at the south end of the county share in the diversity of our student population, and please do not create a second Collins Elementary. Ms. Crane will be next, followed by John will apologize to Ms. Bondro. I apologize if I said that correctly, Kristen Bondro, and then Rachel Kernbeck. Ms. Crane? I'm Stephanie Crane. I live in the sub, uh, Steeple Chase subdivision. I was excited about the new school at first until I heard about these new redistrict, redistricting. I have looked up the schools and learned that a lot of other schools are under capacity. So why don't you redistrict other places also to make it more satisfying for everyone to be, so we don't make this school a, just a free lunch school, just like Collins. I understand Collins is ever staffed and they need help. Why not try to move them also to other places? You have Florence that's at capacity. I understand that then you have Erkenbeck, Long Branch, Yaley, Ackerman, and Mann. That's in Collins, no, Collins is over, but the other ones I mentioned are under capacity. So you could move other people too, to where it's just not steeplechase that's going to suffer to where our houses are going to be um, lowered in value. Because if you look at the schools that have all the free lunches, their ratings are low. Collins is at a zero rating, Florence is at a one star rating, Ackerman is at a two star rating. Those are the free lunch schools. It's not right. <coughs> for you to make the brand new school at Steeple Chase a free lunch school automatically. And you're re and then you're moving people from out of the way. You're not even touching heritage or any, almost none of Triple Crown. And they're the closest to our schools. And I, I believe we need new scenarios. Cause I don't think either of these two are good for our area at all. And like um, the previous person said, there is still development in our area of condos, apartments, and houses still being built. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Kristen Boudreau. I'm a resident at Eagle Chase. And as a resident, I look out my back window. My uh, backyard actually faces Grand National Boulevard where I see all of the construction for this new school build, which is exciting. But it's also really worrisome to me how congested our neighborhood roads will become based on the traffic pattern. And this concerns me based on the redistricting, the scenarios that have been presented. And so I'm questioning, do the scenarios include a back exit from this school? Not just for the traffic, but for the safety of the children first responders that may need to come into our school. How do we get these kids out in a situation like this when you have one clogged entrance? In addition, we have this construction that's going on for who knows how much longer. And so my question to the committee is, are we considering this and how are we gonna take care of this? And what I'm concerned is, is that when we're looking at the redistricting, if you're not gonna include kids that are on chambers, then you're telling us 
that's closed off. We can't bus that way because we're not including those kids. So do we not get an exit back there? That's concerning. Um, and then I also just wanted to uh, include the fact about opening at capacity. Again, I see all the development going the, up the other street that passes my cul-de-sac where they're building new homes back there. And that's a huge concern when you think about opening at capacity. What do you then do with the children that now are overcrowded? So I think you're trying to solve one problem from another school only to potentially create the same problem in our neighborhood. So I don't know how that makes sense to solve one problem only to really potentially create another. And we're seeing that with the development. So I respectfully request that the committee will take into the, uh, this into consideration. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Draw, I thought that was an end. Oh, that's okay. It's a hard one. Uh, Ms. Herman, and then um, Mr. Adam Bell, and Tom Hall, in that order. Thank you. I just want to start with thanking you guys for allowing us to come today. Um, I grew up in this county. I grew up in the school system, specifically in the, the zone that you guys are communicating today. I'm a young family. I just purchased my home a couple of years ago in Steeple Chase, and I have a desire to have the family that my parents had um, growing up in Boone County and sending their, their children to these schools. Now, as somebody who's recently purchased a home and from this area, I highly look at the schools and the zones of where my children are going to be. Obviously, the market right now is really great. I've considered moving, but I will only move into certain schools that my children will go to. Collins is not a school that I want my child to go to. It won't even be a house that I would list. If it was the best price on a house, I wouldn't even look at that house because of the school zone that it's in. I feel as if you're creating another Collins Elementary School by putting it into steeplechase. When you communicate the vectors, it really helps me understand what needs to go to consideration for the school zone. I don't feel like you are considering all the vectors, one being the socioeconomics if you're looking at the socioeconomics, if you see it's going to be a Title I school, you would expect if three-fourths of the school is coming from a low-income family, that that would be in a low-income neighborhood, not in a non-low-income neighborhood. Also, you mentioned the travel. You are talking about how long can children be on the bus. I'm not currently over in that section, but Collins Elementary is seven miles away from Steeplechase. There are multiple other schools where we can redistrict Collins to, one being Yaley, which is four miles away. You could go to Offerman Middle Elementary School, three miles away, Florence Elementary School, which is 1.5 miles away. So there's three schools right there where these children can regrow into. I don't believe that you guys are leaving the capacity into consideration with, I'm just gonna speak on behalf of her too. I don't feel like you're leaving the consideration of the growth that needs to go into this with 35 acres for sale right at the front of our neighborhood where it's listing that's potential to grow new families and put in apartments. There's acreage between Sutherland and Steeplechase that's been listed for sale that they're hoping a developer will continue to buy and expand these neighborhoods. In the previous meeting, you communicated that a lot of this area cannot continue to develop because there's no sewer lines and there's no um, water. Well, Triple Crown is not completely finished. They're bringing it all the way down to Richwood Road and still continue to expand. So that vector of the growth opportunity, the vector of socioeconomics does not make sense to me, and the vector of transportation and redistricting these children. They're, you guys are considering bringing children from Florence across the Union into Walton, which does not make sense when we have still so much growth happening right here in this small area. I would ask that you guys consider the man and New Haven restructuring, you guys are leaving the southern portion of Triple Crown still sectioned into New Haven when they're right across the street from our intersection. That should easily be redistricted into sequel chase and allow for this area to continue to grow where we're not going to be opening at capacity and having the children that match the socioeconomics of the neighborhood being built in. You guys mentioned that you informed everybody that could potentially be affected by this. I don't know one person in the Steeplechase neighborhood who has received a letter. I have not received a letter. I would hope as my children begin getting in school, which they will begin in next year, 
that if my children are in this, I would have better communication from the school board about what potentially could affect my child versus communication that I have to seek out versus being received. So I would ask for the next public forum that the neighborhood being in effect would be notified because I don't know if they are. Well, and then Mr. Pope. Everybody's pretty much well said. Uh, a lot of my thoughts. Um, we did move to the neighborhood, of course, um, to have our kids go to the same schools that we did. Uh, Lindsay, New Haven, Gray, and Ryle. Hello again. It's been 16 years, I think. I remember. <laughs> so, um, you know, we were excited about seeing the opportunity of a new school being in the neighborhood. You know, our kids, we have three now, being able to walk the street, go to the school. Um, just with the redistricting, we're considering, you know, going private, of course, as previously mentioned. But um, I was, I think Stephanie already reached out to you, but I don't know if there's any way, I know the districts are laid out the way they are, but is there any way to give the opportunity to anyone to still remain at New Haven? I guess would be my question. Um, probably not, but uh, that was really my only question for you all to consider. Uh, everyone else did a really good job covering it. So, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Okay, so I guess the first couple of things I wanted to point out is on both of the scenarios that were outlined, New Haven drops by 300 and 375, I think it is. Or was it 200? Let me put my glasses on. I can't see what that was. 300 and 375 students, causing the other schools, Steeple Chase in particular, to be much closer to capacity. So in scenario one, Steeple Chase goes to capacity. In scenario two, Collins doesn't get the reduction they need. And we're pulling that many people from New Haven. So the question there is why? Why are we pulling them so far under the capacity? Take a look at that. The other thing I had, and then he had some things, was have we done a formal study on how many miles these kids are transporting, how long they're spending on buses? When I saw the geography of one of them, the new steeplechase school is kind of going down this way with New Haven coming up this way. And that just from my head to geographic didn't make any sense. So I would like to see if the board would do a study that says, with this redistricting giving the density populations in the different areas, what is the best thing to do countywide to minimize transportation costs and minimize the time the kids are on the buses, as well as looking at the socioeconomic factors? And, and that's all I had. I don't know what you had. Um, I'm going to piggyback on a couple of things um, as far as he said. Um, is there going to be a regional bus barn like parking lot at this structure as well? For, for bus routes that don't even service in our area? Because right. we heard that's true. Man, we're, uh, those kind of answers we will try to get for you. Uh, tonight is just to gather information. We will take the questions. Well, that leads on to my next point. My next point is is I uh, have been a first respondent for 22 years. And to make me back on that lady's question of her, or her time, if you have a, an MCI up there, you got one way in and it's the same way out. Um, and you're not going to be able to get the uh, ambulance, you're not going to have a fire truck in there. Or what. And plus, it's just going to be, you know, people in the neighborhood. It's a, it's a cluster just waiting to happen. And you open yourself up to some huge liability that I'll leave. Uh, secondly, uh, with the whole bus, even a whole, the bus barn idea is not going to be true. Um, putting an awful lot of heavy traffic, extra traffic on Grand National and the levy, I might add. Uh, can we assume that the county is going to keep rebuilding that levy and rebuilding those roads? The only road we have coming into our one subdivision. It makes no sense to me at all, at all. Um, and um, in terms of um, uh, the access, well, that I just, it boggles my mind that we were proposing to leave and 
initial conversation, there would be one changes. And are we even considering the kids and the neighborhood safety by putting that kind of structure or that much uh, uh, activity? And the third, again, if there is going to be a, a regional outdoor bus barn, you're going to have three times a day when you have buses coming down Grand National when people are trying to go to work or go to come home. And uh, that's just going to, again, it's going to, you only got one, one, one side road basically down the Fox Hunch. To go uh, to the other side of the that side of uh, that side of uh, people chase. So and, and I'll say it, it hasn't been said it's somewhat even snacks of elitism uh, in terms of how we're not making use of the uh, schools or uh, across the road. And my time's up. Thank you. Mr. Turner? That with all of the Indian American sign up speaking on set. Thank you. As well, we thank you for your, your public comment, all your input. Many of you, I know I've written emails to myself and others. We appreciate that input. This will all go back to the committee for their work, and uh, they will be putting together more information to you then present. So uh, we will be having another public forum, as I mentioned, um, on Thursday, October the 29th at 7 p.m. right here. Uh, we'll be uh, essentially following the same type of uh, program and presenting more information, gathering more feedback, and moving forward from there. So we thank you for coming out this evening and sharing, and uh, look forward to seeing you again. Take care. We're adjourned.